Blog Talk Radio. Yo, 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 what's up, what's up, world? It's badass thugging like I usually do. And you better turn it up, bust some speakers out, because we off the motherfucking cup. You dig how we do it? Dog Pound Gangsters 2000 and beyond. Yo, yo, check this out. This is your girl, Cola Boke, and I'm chilling with my boys right here on Off the Cuff Radio. Because we're off the cuff right now. You big? Yeah. Uh, oh, what's up? What's up? It's your boy, Lil Yap, and you and LV. Bragging them from the river, cooling with my homies and my family at Off the Cuff Radio. Y'all be sure to tune in on Fridays and get the latest scoop and find out what's happening. You with me? Tiffany Levine. And this Queen Cruz is your girl for the bartender. And we're from Sex on the Rocks Podcast. All right, and you're now tuning in to Off the Cuff Radio. Yeah, because they keep representing that world hip hop. Well, much love. All right. This is Miss Irresistible giving a shout out to the live show on Friday nights off the cuff radio. And I'm live from the 704. Make sure y'all tune in for the blazing hot music. Hey y'all, this is Stacey Lachey giving a shout out to King Eric and off the cuff radio. We're shaking, y'all. This is the grand. One half of Lost Cause and one third of that drive time thing. Sending my love to the homies over at Off The Cuff Radio. Tune in every Friday night for some real deal hip-hop conversation. These dudes are the connoisseurs of this thing. You already know what it is. BX Stand Up, Hud City, we're shaking. Peace. Yo, this is Joe Fresh to Dine, and y'all tuned in to the most raw, uncut show on radio. The Killer Team Team, Off The Cuff, and yo, Eric Sandman, Off The Cuff Clown, man. Dropping loops, no matter who produced it or who helmet With this music, I'm a brute like Farouk with the blue helmet In the dungeon with the stoop I'm getting the brew gelling so these tracks get stretched Like students in school yelling, word to Ellen, baby boy The black heart, they ain't touching rust Never been a nugget, but I'm telling them enough's enough Time for a change in my prime, taking shine from the lames Dominating with the lines for my brain, cuz Shit Domination, resting bios and rated. That's a hell of a combination. It's fellas in common. Any problems become a memory. Forever trying to stop my top guy energy. I'm one of one. All these comparisons be offending me. No friends, just me, not my brother. You an enemy. One man gang. I never need any team while I'm chasing these dreams. I'ma get it by any means. Yeah. Y'all was patient, now the wait is over I had the world on my shoulders Never folded from no way to boulders Keep being cocky, make the haters bolder But they can't stop me though It's feeling like when Rocky took the nation over Y'all was patient, now the wait is over I had the world on my shoulders Never folded from no way to boulders Keep being cocky, make the haters bolder But they can't stop me though It's feeling like when Rocky took the nation over Here's the download for as soon as you put my record on I'm aiming for your chest I better put your protection on. Bet I'm playing chess, so if you get in your seconds on, then you just a pawn for the king, just a second pawn. Never PG, they all say he nice. Great at all, I ain't Luffy D or JC Ice. I was a no name, trying to get the door and claim massacres. Now they all the ball like some whole train passengers. Instead of trying matching me, just take the whole spit and felony flows. I'm consistently breaking laws since that world stripping proper booking. I'm the next great Queens MC, they about to smell with four rockets cooking It's hell kitchen But I'm not from Brooklyn With these well written verses I'm the subject of a lot of looking Y'all dudes can't harm all ever So it's time for me to usher in the arm bar era Man, Y'all was patient now The way it is over I had the world on my shoulders Never folded from the way to boulders Me being cocky make the haters bolder But they can't stop me though It's feeling like when Rocky took the nation over Y'all was patient now The way it is over I had the world on my Shoulders never folded from the way to boulders. Me being cocky make the haters bolder, but they can't stop me though. It's feeling like when Rocky took the nation over.
production. Give me a hell Looking past swag rappers, cause none of you pieces of trash matter And it's time to whip fast as soon as the glass shatter I'm letting my foot smash him in the abdomen Climbing up the ladder cause you fool just as sweet as Pat Patterson As long as I'm the baddest, you never hearing them bragging it Another rest of wild collab, I know they mad at me Stepped up in the booth and start battering The beast taking action, so I'ma lead the chatter to the week Hell yeah, hell yeah Cause I ain't never been a talking guy I'm the type to stomp a mud hole and walk and try I'm flipping birds on the regular, they open flop I hold them towards the sky Just like a monster cause I had about enough with being tossed aside I'm a force of nature that was forced to ride I'm going off with pride live Been striving for respect for a while Cause they treat me like a dog but expect me to smile huh? Had a million dollar dream till I mastered the ring Found three sixteens on the path of the king Flip birds till I'm smashing their wings Make it so they can't handle all these cans of whip ass I'm a brick What? Getting drunk without a kid. What? Hell yeah. Middle fingers in the air. What? Hell yeah. Just throw me another beer. What? Hell yeah. If you feel it, what you hear, give me a hell yeah. Big time ain't the banner. It's the number one son. All it takes is one finish. Have him known for one son of the tough son of a gun. Try to keep it 100. Even when face to face with the reaper one summer and survive. Gotta thrive. What I need to be defiant in the lead. To succeed, so I'm leading the alliance. Never do it for the greed or the salary. Snakes can't grab me. I got a stone cold mentality. Don't trust anybody. And that's the bottom line. I ain't motivated by the dollar sign. Do it for the love. That's how I went viral off a lot of rhymes. Now I'm done announcing my arrival because the title mine. I claim the belt and I'm changing the whole look. Made a name without the gang. I'm leaving them all shook. The vets, the old works. Don't matter who you bring because I'm holding up my middle finger the whole look. Had a million dollar dream till I mastered the ring. Found three sixteens on the path of the king. Flip birds till I'm smashing their wings. Make it so they can't. Can't handle all these cans of whip ass I'm a brick. What? Getting drunk without a kid. What? Hell yeah. Middle fingers in the air. What? Hell yeah. Just throw me another beer. What? Oh shit. If you feel what you hear, give me a hell yeah. And we are now tuned in at episode 355, man. What it do, y'all? This is your man, King Egg the Great, and you're now tuned in at the livest hip-hop show on Friday nights and Sunday nights, Off the Cuff Radio, sponsored by Buddy Boy Entertainment, sponsored by Jesse Boutique, sponsored by Core Financial, and tonight, man, we have a special guest on the line. The reason why I had to reach out to this man here because... He's one of the few artists that I've heard that knows how to blend the craftsmanship of professional wrestling and hip-hop and make it a dope at that. So he put the Rey Mysterio mask on, and he's pulled up the -the off-the-cuff radio, man, and he's going to tell us more about his craftsmanship, his pin game, his love for the business of wrestling, so without further ado, before I wait, hold on, before I bring him on, I got my host team match with the facts in the building. We ride yep, the what it do? Yep, what it do? It's front and Friday night. OTC placed a guy in the figure four all over, man, making the haters submit. You know what I'm saying? We the chance of this thing. What it do? Yes, indeed, man. I mean, you know, I had to give me, uh, I had to give uh, rated R our guest of the night. The rated R yeah. superstar, aka the rated R aggressor, whatever you want to call him, he's pulled up right now on the line, y'all. Let him Yo, know. Y'all can hear me, you know what? Y'all can hear me? Yeah, yes, we can hear you. We can Hello? hear you. Oh, oh yeah. Because right, right, I was like, I was listening. I'm like, oh, all right, I want to show that I can talk and all that, man. First of all, I want to say thank you for the invitation, man. I'm happy to be here. Yes, man, sir. Look, we're happy man. to have you on, man. Yeah, yeah, five, and also, man. I'm sorry, yeah, I know before we, we got to, um, I know we about to get to business, but I had a loss in my family, I just want to rest, say a little rest in peace real quick to Jerry Munyon. um, he's like a father to me, man, he passed away earlier today, just want to get that shout That's out real awesome. quick before we get it, yeah, yeah, thank you, man, a little rough day, but 
We here, man. It's ready to get it, ready to get it going, man. Talk about the stuff, man. I was so happy I reached out though. Definitely, man. Yep. Look, you know. And you know, we also want to send a condolences to uh, Tiny Lister, aka Debo. He passed away last night. That's a big loss for the game. Yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah, it's funny man. you made a little crossover from hip hop culture and wrestling too, because he was a he was a wrestling character back in the day too. Yeah, no holds barred. They know that. Yeah, yeah. Is you know no holds barred. Or, you know against Hulk Hogan. You know with Hulk Hogan. You know, but I think that came out back in like what eighty seven, eighty eight, man. So yeah. yeah, and then he he had a couple of matches too. He was teamed up with Ted DiBiase. You know, like against Hulk Hogan. So. And you know, then he was with Friday, the whole hip hop connection there. It's like all this stuff is intertwined, man. Everything connected in a way. Definitely, definitely, and man. Up, and the key you break, know. man. I was one of those few heads that was I was hoping Zeus was gonna win the title and bring it back to the hood, man. <laughs> 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 That's a suck word. That would have been something right there. Definitely, man. But nah, I ain't trying to. I ain't gonna talk ill of the man at that. But like, wrestling wasn't his, his strong suit. I'll just say that. Like, yeah, he, he was better off acting. Yeah, man. I Definitely. mean, it would have been a cool moment though, because I was like, imagine him beating Hogan. Then he'll come up to the Friday movie with the belt on. <laughs> All right, man, you beat Hulk Hogan. You know he's taking chains too. <laughs> <laughs> chains and belts. All that. <laughs> But nevertheless, man, you know, rest in peace to, to Tiny, man. Big salute and thoughts and prayers go out to his family and friends that love him. And we're all at, at, at it, man. We got the rated all superstar the builder, man. Tell us about yourself. <laughs> what made you want to get into rap music? And we can get you on the way. All right, yo, so um, me, I'm from Far Rockaway, Queens, man, so, like, only child grew up. My mom's raised me single parent household. You know, got friends and all that. My uncle, big big person in my life, he was a big hip hop head growing up. So that right there gave me that connection. And my mom used to like wrestling, so I got that. Watching that with her, I start liking it myself. You know, and then you know, I was always into. I used to do poems when I was young. That's how I had a lot of people started like that too. Like I used to get, I got like awards for writing poems in school and all that. I got a poem in the yearbook, like, just from always being, like, curious to work with words like that. So then I kind of made this natural evolution into hip-hop. So I did the whole regular rap route, get the instrumentals, make little mixtapes like that for a couple years back in the early 2000s. You know how that goes. Everybody take that route when they first start. Did that for a while. Then I, um, I, got, to, I got the idea trying to mix two things I love. Like from Wu Tang, you see how they brought the kung fu to the hip hop, and they did it. They made it seem like a seamless type of thing. Like they brought it together, and they they used that heavily. Thirty six chambers, everybody got kung fu drops in they they songs and all of that. So I'm like, yo, it'd be dope if you could take wrestling, because wrestling you get a bunch of decades worth of drops and all types of stuff. So I had the idea. Then I had to figure out how to make beats. So I bought all, I started work, I worked, saved all my money up, got the um, equipment, you know what I mean? Took a couple years learning how to do it. Then around 2012, 2013, I dropped my first song, like with the new style, the whole, I flipped the Dunk the Clown beat and did a whole song like that. And then just been working ever since, just getting a little, little increments, little making little connections, just moving, moving. Yeah, by year, by year, 2016, I started a Twitter, and that's when everything started happening. So, <laughs> long story short, I mean, it probably wasn't be read to know, but just trying to get as much detail as I could. Oh, no, not a problem, man. And, you know, one thing about it, man, is that, you know, with your pedigree coming from far walk away, Queens, man, I mean, just in Queens in general, you know, the legacy of hip hop is so strong, you know, with you know, Ja Rule, you know, with L L, you know, Rest in Peace and Zach Bundles, you know, Chinks Drug, yeah. you, know, you know, Fifty Cent, yeah. you know, Southside, you know what I'm saying, you know, uh Hoogie Rap coming from Corona, you know what I'm saying? We gotta take it over the Queens Bridge, yeah. you know, of course. Shout out to hey, Little, you know, you know Mob Deep, Nas, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. 
Yeah. And it's a funny thing, like I seen from when you was advertising, you got a scoop on radio. The funny thing about that is like KL for a time lived out here, right? And he was close to the dude that just passed away today. So it's like a whole connection thing. So when I um when I was when I was first coming up, KL kinda of was like a mentor to KL was kinda of like a mentor to me. He was teaching me just like how to do sixteens and structure songs and all that. You know, so I learned a lot from there. And I'm not sure if Poet remember me, but I remember Poet. I'm hopefully, like, we, if you ever see me, you might be like, oh, yeah, I do remember you because you used to come out here, too. So I was like, yo, that connection, everything, everything is like, oh, yeah, it's a small world, man. <laughs> it is. Um, now, one thing, too, R, is this. You know, when we look at wrestling, um, you know, King and myself, you know, we're older. We're from that generation uh, of that early 80s to mid-90s and even 2000s, early 2000s, uh, when wrestling was really special. I mean, but when you take it back to the 80s, which, you know, um, the old, you know, NWA, you know, I mean, WWF, you know, I mean, all the stars that came in through that time, you know, like Hulk Hogan, I mean, Andre the Giant, Junkyard Dog, you know, Roddy Piper, Iron Sheet, Nikolai Volkov, you know, Ivan Koloff, Crusher Cruise Ship, Lex Luger, yeah, Rick Flair, yeah, you know Randy Savage. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, of course. I mean, Iceman, Var- you know, Iceman, you know, oh, Iceman um, Parsons. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you know, Abdullah the Butcher, you know, uh, you know, um, Bruiser Brody. I mean, this was, Bruiser. yeah, I mean, this, yeah, this was not only a time of where, Wrestling with that, well, arguably was at its pinnacle, but it was also the most entertaining and engaging element of it, where there was personality. I mean, the promos were legendary. I mean, when we break it down, you know, that was our soap opera. You know, for the, for, yeah. for, for the, you know, for the, you know, that was our soap opera. You know, with the testosterone. You know, and um, I mean, you know, when you look at it though, with a lot of people break it down, you know, the, the, the game of hip hop and wrestling are so intertwined in terms yeah, of, you know, you always got the contenders, yeah, about the contenders of who's the best. And it's all about, you know, the style of how you come to the ring, you know, that you got different, you know, personalities and charisma, you know. And I mean, just when you're doing those shoots and I mean you you know, I mean with you know, of course, some of the best you know, I mean, of course, Ric Flair, you know, um, uh-huh. you know, Road Warriors, I mean, you know, you know, Rock and Roll Express, I mean, Rock and Roll, guys, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, when you look at, I mean, these guys just, I mean, of course, the Four Horsemen, when they would come together, I mean, that was like the first big, real, the first real big posse, you know what I'm saying? It uh-huh. was like, put the, I mean, the Horsemen beat down. The Horsemen yeah. beat down. Those are legendary. <laughs> Get one of those. Yeah. And you know and now. On top of that, yeah. man, like, what was yeah. the moment like? The moment it was, a, it had to be a storyline or a match or something. Like, what was yeah. the that made you be like, "Yo, I fuck with this here. This is live." <laughs> so for me, back then, like, um, it was real early. Like, I remember it was the night I was watching it with my moms and my pops. It was like when Ricky Steamboat and my and Macho Man Savage, and he had yeah. came from outside yeah. the raid to him and he hit his neck on the um the, the, the rig barrier, barrier the, the barricade bell, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 with the rig bell, and I was like, that was it. The cat, I was captivated from that moment because I watched how my parents reacted, and I just kind of was hooked. But like as I got older, I was like a Bret Hart guy, so I kind of just wrote told yeah. like. Rode the wave with him, like watch his whole story, how he came up from the tag teams and rose up the ranks and all of that to the chip, to the top guy. So it's kind of like, yeah, I, I, I kind of that was the person that I got hooked on that really made me just get back into it. You know, when I was young, it was the Hulk Hogan's because you know when you watching, that's who the, who the top guy is. But when they when they transitioned to Brett, that's kind of like my era right there. I'm like, all right, that's when I start being a little bit more wise to matches, match quality, and all of that. Like, all right, I understand who's who's good and who's not. I'm like, all right, that's when I start looking at it a little bit more critical. And I think that has it has to do with him being at the type of matches he put on. You would notice the difference yeah. when he not in the matches. You like, all right, hold on, all right, all right. Now I see it's different levels to this. 
Definitely. Plus, what Brett, you know, what made Brett so dope was he knew how to make these matches look like real life, real life fights. You know what I'm saying? He knew how they to felt like fights. Yeah, in it. struggles. It felt like struggles. Like if he did something, it made sense. He wasn't just diving, just to dive anytime like in the match, just because it's time to hit a dive. Like hit his opponent, we get out of the side, get outside the ring in a natural way, and then in the progression of his offense would be all right. All right, he. This motherfucker down here, I'm a jump on him. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it all makes sense. Definitely. Definitely. When you look at it, man, like you said, it's an art form to it because, you know, when you're looking at it in terms of, and so much, we got so much respect for it because, you know, uh, of course, Mr. Man, you know, he coined it, you know, rightfully so, uh, which he has a patent mm-hmm. on it, sports entertainment. You know, I mean, obviously yeah. it's scripted like a TV show. It's what it is. Uh-huh. You know, uh, we, you know, <laughs> you know, we, we were, we learned at a young age, it was, you know, that it was fake, you know, but it was scripted in terms of the action. But I mean, the guy, the way that these guys really put the action together was engaging. I mean, of course, you know, Bret Hart, you know, rest in peace to Jim Neidhart, you know, they had the Hart Foundation, oh, yeah. you know, when they started. Uh-huh. You know, a, 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 you know, rest in peace, Anvil. You know, but it's like, you know, those guys really, um, like, you know, I mean, in the, I, I mean, just to, you know, when you look at it, how do you compare hip hop to the visual appeal and the style and the overall engagement of how to really structure, you know, what you do in terms of really, you know. Engaging your fans and really bringing an audience to your world up. So right now, um, it's still a work in progress. With like, so my answer is me still figuring it out because like I'm, I'm no, I'm doing little things now to get more notice. Like the whole partnership with Wrestling Bios is is doing wonders, but that came about for me just sticking to my course and doing my like. So how I did it when I approached. To doing the hip hop and the wrestling thing, I, I have like a because I've been watching so long and it's like something I was into. I have like a, a lot of DVDs, a lot of the the stuff they was doing before the network and all of that. So over that time, I accumulated like a knowledge that interest music, and I was always just like, "Yo, damn, would it be hot if somebody made a beat out of this one or made a beat out of that one?" So when I when I learned how to make beats, that was the intention. To learn, so whenever I did, I would be able to start maybe flipping them, flipping some of them to make songs from them. So that evolved over time. And when it comes to making the songs and making a hip hop connection, it's like you try to do it naturally. You try to tell a story. Like if there's a person, I usually try to do songs about people that I I enjoy. So I feel like it ain't like it's not forced or anything. It's just like I'm really just able to let it flow naturally because it's like I right, I don't watch this person for years. I know the offense. I know. So I kind of try to put myself in the mentality of maybe, like, how they would approach it. Like, you know what I mean? So, yeah, it's kind of like that. So it's a lot of the metaphors. is just, like, flips or you would, like, they moves. You would compare it to, like, you know what I mean? Like, they finish your move, you use it. And just then that's kind of how I structure it. Yeah, you know man. what's wild, you know. too, is, y'all, I don't know if both of y'all remember this, but I remember even back when wrestling was hitting its peak, High popularity terms. The WWF they released the Ruthless Aggression soundtrack. Of course, and they had rappers course, rapping yep. over that. Yeah, of course. That's the um, that's where I get my t- um the Ruthless Aggressive from. It come from that album from that con- because that was like part of the first time I really seen that as something that was viable. You know, another one that don't get that much credit is when Wyclef did the song. He had the rock do the hook on it. Um, if, it doesn't matter. I don't know if y'all remember that. Yeah. Like when Wyclef uh-huh. first went it solo, he had did it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. He had the rock on the hook, like. So that's kind of like one of the things. I'm like, oh, that's kind of dope. And they did the aggression album. I'm like, all right, there you go. That's it right there. But then it kind of just that idea just went away. It just kind of like I feel like it's the evolution of it. Yeah, man, you know, and before copyrights became a thing back in the day, I think one part, you know, and I think King will agree with me on this, are, is that it was always kick-ass to hear those songs back in the day. Like, I mean, of course, you had Bonnie Tyler's Ravishing. That was Hulk Hogan's original song. 
before he went to <laughs> I'm a Real American uh, because, you know, Rick Derringer did a lot of that stuff yeah, with uh-huh. WWF back in, the day, yeah. back in the day, just like when you had uh, Legion of Doom using Black Sabbath's Iron Man, of course. Rest Hell in peace yeah. to Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert. He would have Hot Stuff yeah. by Donna Summer. You know, of course, you would have uh, the New Breed that had, I mean, you know, with uh, Chris Champion and Sean Royal, where they had a BC Boys fight for your right to party. <laughs> um, I ECW mean, was big who else? That too. ECW yeah, had a yeah, lot yeah. Of, uh, I mean, they were using a lot of licensed music. Like, um, Rob Van Dam has, um, what is it, Walk? From, um, I think it's one of the Sarah, rock bands. Man, uh, well, yeah, that, Pantera. Yeah, that, was, yeah. uh, Pantera. that was a Whoa. yeah, and of it's course uh, Taz. Taz, I want to say War Machine by Kiss. You know the uh, original, you know War Machine, and then of course yeah, you know the had, gangsters um, had you know, Natural Born Killers. Yeah, and Sandman was at the Sandman, Sandman of course. Uh huh. <laughs> I mean, um, and I mean that was a yeah, the Sandman and the Sandman. Uh, who else? I mean, oh man. Um, I, I mean, and it, it just, it was just. Then of course, Tommy Dreamer had Alice in Chains. You know, Man in the Box. Man in the Box. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, music. You know, the thing is, I think about wrestlers. You know, when you look at certain. Uh, um, I mean, you know, even even when you take it to the swag, you know, I mean, of Ric Flair, you know, when he had 2001 Space Odyssey, you know, it's his entrance. And then, yeah. of course, gorgeous Jimmy Garvin with ZZ Top, Sharp Dressed Man, you know, Freebirds, you know, Fabulous Freebirds, you know, Michael Hayes, Buddy Rogers, and Terry Gordy, you know, where they had uh, the Freebird and the Sunday Home. They Sunday Home joined that one time, too. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, the own little song. You know, free Bad, uh, Bad, Bad, Street, Bad Street USA. Bad Street USA. Bad Street USA. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, man, look, even, even look, man. I be, you know, um, I, I mean, the '80s and the '90s are just such a wild time in terms of the entertainment factor of it. Um, I, I mean, what do you think? You know, in terms of that history, how do you de- how do you compare the development of wrestling? along with the development of hip-hop culture in terms of how they both evolved in reference to really finding that base. Because you figure, really, wrestling's been around since the 50s, even the 40s, um, even the 30s, you know, but it was right around the late yeah, 70s, long time. early 80s, yeah, that you really, really, really started really seeing it, you know, break through. Um, so you know how you, how you can make that culture? correlation? You know yeah, how you can ahead. do that? You can do it like cable TV, right? Once the invention mm-hmm. of cable, um, MTV started. That's when hip hop started being on MTV. Then they had the war to schedule the score. That's right there with wrestling. Wrestling was on MTV that time where it was Cindy Lapa, um, Captain Lou Albano, somebody else, Captain Lou Albano, Roddy Piper, then Hulk Hogan. They had to run out and all that. I think that that kind of came up around the time. They was having a run DMC and all that, so that that kind of connection. And it was like the eighties, mid eighties. They old, they both was like grown. And then you think right around, so the growth continues through the nineties. You get to the end, around the time we start seeing hip hop really take over pop culture. Like we get number one albums, Jay Z. The um, you see the same time. That's when the Attitude Era's hit. So it's like they both grew right. around that same time. So everything is it's kind of like they hand in hand in a way. Without even knowing it. Yeah, you know, and uh, shout out, you know, and rest in peace to the legend, you know, Captain Lou Albano. Yeah, you know, because Lou. he was the one, a lot of uh, wrestling historians credited him because Lou really doesn't get the props he should because a lot of people say Lou is the unsung hero because, of course, going back to, you know, Cindy Lauper's video, Girls Just Want to Have Fun. You know, uh, back in the day, you know, he played her father in it, but they said he was also one of the figures that him and Cindy uh, really came together by chance. I think it was an airport meeting just by chance, and they were the one, and, of course, they struck up a friendship. He ended up, you know, being in her video, and then that was what they call in the 80s the rock and wrestling movement. You know, of course, you know, uh I remember also, too, back in the 80s, uh, Dirk Benedict, you know, from the 18, he was in a wrestling movie. Um, and it fail, you know, and the name fails me at the moment what it was. But, you know, this is that whole era when you start seeing this. And, uh, you know, of course, 
you know, in the early 80s, you know, you have Hulk Hogan's rock and wrestling. You know, there really was really being embedded in terms of that attitude of, you know, just really the young people's culture of uh, rock music, that MTV, like you said, that MTV era, and really wrestling Uh coming into it, really bringing in that whole young audience. You know, and really, really, really bringing in a whole new generation of fans. You know, um, it, it's just amazing to watch the development of it. I mean, of course, you know, and all the wrestling shows, I mean, shout out to TBS, you know, USA Network, you yeah, know, of course, Fox NBC. Five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah those, you know, and this is like back in the day. I know y'all remember this. Now, I remember, now I could, what made me get into this was, the time where Terry Funk put the plastic bag on Ric Flair's head. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And I was like, yo, yeah, I, this is an attempted murder. And I, and, I, and what I would yeah, do, kill I would look on the news to see if this nigga died or whatnot. I was like, yo, what's going on here? Like, I didn't even talk about this on the news. So they right. Yeah. Man, when you talk yeah, about was like, that... After the Man. Ricky Steamboat matches. <laughs> you know, but that realism know, is what crazy. really was captivating. Because yeah. I think that's what it needs to go back to. Uh, and with the realism comes with the mystique. And that's what made these characters so dope. Because you have that analogy where if you look at Batman, Batman comes through and he saves the day. Nobody really wanted to see Bruce Wayne. Like you want to really look, it wouldn't really look right seeing Batman at the at the dry cleaner getting this getting this suit ready. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. That's so real, what I liked man. about the era back in that day was they knew how to keep those characters mystique, and that's where they was. That's how they would but, do a lot of money. I'm saying you know what it is now? It's the accessibility, though. Like, because every wrestler got a Twitter now. Yeah, you. It's like, even if they did have a mystique on TV, if they out here tweeting on Instagram and all that, they kind of ruining it. You know what I mean? Like, if you're on there and you're seeing that, it kind of take away from the character. So it's like you got to suspend your disbelief even more. Like, back in the day, you seen Abdullah the Butcher... All you ever did was see him on TV. You ain't know he was on, like, traveling. You ain't know how he got to the show or none of that. You just know he was there and with his fault, and he was ready to go. Like, that's all you do. Nowadays, you get to see too much. Yeah, man. And it's wild because, you know, um, you know, of course, we were growing up in that time in the 80s, you know, and even 90s where, uh, this was strictly about the entertainment factor, you know, like King said, you know, social media, you know, you really did not see behind the scenes in terms of what really was going on. Like, uh, of course, one of the most famous matches ever in the history of wrestling, Ricky Steamboat and Randy Savage. And they said uh, those two had, I think Randy Savage had talked about how they had rehearsed in that match. They, cause like, like maybe a couple of weeks before that actual pay-per-view, they have rehearsed it for like uh, like a week at Ricky's house oh. down in Florida. Yeah, Ricky Steam. To... Yeah, Randy Savage was real. He came to him with like a script or something, and they had to yeah. memorize it. Like, <laughs> yeah, because that match was like an hour long. So it's like they were like, "Yo, we like really had to like find a way to choreograph this thing through it for like a whole hour." You know, and I mean, yeah, but... and that's one thing about it, man, because when you're looking at it. You know, it's like a stage show, which is the same element as hip hop because you really got to engage the crowd. You know, it's like writing your lyrics, writing your rhymes. You know, you really got to take the time to be that painstaking, to be that meticulous, to be that thoughtful in terms of what you are presenting out there. I mean, um, the image is everything. I mean, when you look at the Legion of Doom, when they came in back in the day, they would just beat niggas up coming into the ring. It's like, it was a night right there when they came. Those niggas won't sell it nothing, man. That's the funny part about that, because I ain't understood the selling until, like, later on when I got older. But, man, the LOD used to sell nothing. Used to come in. Nah, I know. The hell out of you and leave. I know. <laughs> but it's funny when you mention the presentation thing, right? Like, that's why when right. you answered, I'm like, yo, I'm still trying to figure it out, because this is not, like, something that has a, uh, 
a blueprint or a roadmap of how to get where eventually, you know, I would like to be more known. It's like I'm figuring it out as I go along, but it's like I can't just be out here. You don't want to – it's like you got to straddle what's authentic. You don't want to be out here becoming a, a presentation or a gimmick, like, just to try to get noticed. Or oh, that's not what I want to do. I know that's a popular – route that people take, but that's not really the way I'm doing it. I feel like I should go about it. So it's like, you want to you wanna make some, give them something that's eye-catching and attention-grabbing while being true to yourself, and it's like, while doing something different. So it's like a formula I'm still figuring it out as I go along. And going with yeah. the music, yeah. man, when you did the Ray Mysterio joint, that was something different that I haven't seen a lot of people because ever since... In the new era, it seemed like a lot of people, or they have either done it or they're starting to incorporate more wrestling into their rap. Like you know, you see it with Griselda, you see it with Smoke Dizza, and you and you see it becoming more mainstream. But the way you did it, man, you came and used not only Ray's old theme, but you brought the nigga mask on, and that made the presentation look dope. <laughs> and I um I also I went out there to Big Pump Mural too. I was in the Bronx. Went to the Joker steps and all that. I bought the big pun thing and just for the, you know, the whole go with the luchador vibes. I'm like, it's not Mexican, but it's still, you know, it's still showing love to the Latinos or whatever. And today happened to be Ray Mysterio's birthday, too. So that's fire, too. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, yeah it's a nice book. Everything connected. But, yeah, I own um, with that. Yeah, like, I felt comfortable using doing the mask because I'm not new to rapping about wrestling. So I feel like if that would have been something I did as like a first song, it would have seemed more like a gimmick. But because I'm known in the community some uh, somewhat, it doesn't. And I've been around. It's not like I'm just using it to be like to come in and use the genre or anything like that. So I think I, it was time that I was able to do something like that. So I just went all in. Definitely, man. And you know we can't we can't forget. You know, of course, shout out to Ray Mysterio being from San Diego and all the surrounding areas. Of course, Oceanside, Chula Vista. Yeah. You know, shout out. Yeah. To, you know, Southeast. You know, Logan Heights. Of course, Lincoln Park, Skyline. You know, Lucid. You know, Manomet. You know, Lincoln. You know, we see y'all out there. You know, in Southern California, <laughs> much yeah. love, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know. Um, you know. You know. When we. You know, because it's like. You know, when you mentioned the Luchadors, of course, which is Mexican for wrestling, we didn't really see that scene come until like the late '90s when it, it was well, like the mid-80s. Nah, it was you, the mid, yeah, yeah, like it was the like the mid '90s like because um, WCW, like when Nitro, yeah, they used to put the Luchadors yeah. on in the beginning of the show. Like that's when you see like Super Calo, La Parker, yeah. Ultimo Dragon, Psychosis, Rey yeah. Mysterio, Dean Malenko. Chris Benoit, Chris Jericho, all of those dudes. That's what you used to see them. Yeah. And then and I mean, WWE even... kind of like took, like kind of adopted it afterwards. But yeah, in the beginning, yeah, that's where I, mean... I. But yeah, and even oh, yeah, I was gonna say because I seen that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I was seeing that on yeah. you know from I'm from New York. Like I'm saying for a lot, we used to sometimes. I would be able to stay up and see ECW, so a lot of the little, they had little Lucha Dudes on there, too. So that's why I'm like, oh. And sometimes the Lucha Libre channel, I, I couldn't understand that, but sometimes you catch the wrestling, you'll be on there watching it, and you see some of the same wrestlers from Nitro and all that. Yeah, man. Uh, when you mentioned Bret Hart, you know, I can we cannot forget, you know, that rivalry he had with Kakushi, a.k.a., you oh, know, the human yeah. kamikaze. Yeah, yeah. Hakushi. It's and funny you mentioned that. WWF like, was, was garbage yeah. that year too, but they they tore it down every time they wrestled. And Brett made Brett yeah. tried to do what he could with, with what they gave him that year. Yeah, you know uh, it was a rough Jinsei, year. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Jinsei Sasaki. Yeah, that was uh, what he went by. Uh huh. Yep. Jinsei Sasaki, Hakushi, aka Hakushi. Yep. But I mean, yo, that was like. I mean, you know, I was course. young too, so I'm thinking he really had those tattoos all over his body. I'm like, yo, this man crazy. <laughs> yeah, man, dog. But I mean, what was it, King? Who was that? What was that legendary Matt? Who was uh, his partner in '98 when they fought Rob Van Dam and Sabu and ECW with the fight? Yo, yes. Oh, 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 what's that dude? Um, 
I know it's just Hold on, I gotta yeah. get his name. Yeah, but that was like yes, yes, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, because we're shamelessly gonna big up YouTube and WWE because if you want to watch the match, it is on YouTube. You know, this is one of the great things <laughs> that WWE provided for us because you can watch it on YouTube. Because watching that match took me all the way back to 1998. Dog, that was like one of the illest matches I have ever seen in my life. It wasn't how you boost it, right? Yeah, it was. Hayabusa, yeah, Hayabusa, right? Yeah, Hayabusa. Yeah. Hayabusa. I just remember the match. Sasaki. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's Hayabusa. Yeah, that match was crazy. I yeah. was like. But that whole RVD Sabu feud was fire. Like, when they was, they was friends sometimes, they, uh, Sabu was a little jealous, you know what I mean? Because RVD always getting all the attention. They had a nice little story. Yeah, Remind man. Remind me of Hogan you know, and Seth. Yeah, 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 a little, on his, on, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Word. And but mean, nah, that no mega power about... explode. That's the story right there. And it's crazy. And I'm going to tell y'all this, man. And, and T-Mac laugh yeah. when I say this, man. But I think Hulk Hogan was a straight sucker, man. Like, how you going to? We knew he was a <laughs> oh, sucker. Oh, yeah, that's how he was. <laughs> On that yeah, man that's white. Line, he knew definitely. Who the fly was. <laughs> yeah, definitely he was a sucker in that. Yeah, I was I was sided with uh, Jesse Ventura and Bobby Heenan, man. I, we knew he was. They dirty. was right. They was right. Lus Hogan. Lus <laughs> 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 Hogan. <laughs> but you know it's crazy because um, and I can't remember who they interviewed years ago. Um, it was one of those wrestlers, and it was like a it was a, like a it was like a uh, and this is kind of like when they were you know um, shout out to you know Monday Night Show because they were begin because this is the time that they were kind of showing the wrestlers outside the ring like actually is you know just you know in terms of talking about guys in terms of the training. So I remember when they talked about Hogan, and they asked, uh, I can't remember who it was, um, it might have been, um, I don't know if it was, Dallas, it was, I don't know if it was Dallas Page or whomever, but they were asking questions to this guy about who it was, about what he thinks, they asked, they said, uh, they asked, I'm going to give you a name and you tell me what you think, they said Hulk Hogan, talent plus, you know, opportunity equals success, then they said Randy Savage, they said never met a harder worker. Um, Diamond Dallas Page. Uh, I think he, you know, if he wasn't the one they were talking to, he said, always got the most out of his ability. You know, so you saw these guys in terms of we were so amazed because we're beginning to watch these individuals, seeing them as people. Because, you know, people got to understand, just like with hip hop, you know, this is a job. You know, these wrestlers are on the day, you know, we, we, you know, we're looking at it from a situation of what it is in terms of, and King can correct me if I'm wrong in terms of the terminology with it, when you're looking at the house shows, which are the televised, you know, you're doing your exhibitions, and then you actually have your house shows that are what you would say are the quote-unquote storyline uh, performances. So, you know, even when going back in the day, you would see these individuals on Monday night and Thursday night or even Fridays and Saturdays, doing shows these are people who are still like doing the week or touring and doing moving around you yeah. know like so these, these, uh-huh. these you know these, these they said these guys were like on the road and we can't I mean, you know we we, we 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 would be remiss to leave out the legendary ladies you know shout out rest in peace to uh you know may young you know fabulous moolah shout out to wendy richter you know of course you know woman rest in Wanna peace yeah, Luna Vachon, you know, daughter Sherry Dad, Martell. Vachon. Yes, yes sir. Yes, no Sherry Martell, you know. Yeah, man, I mean, you know, uh, you know, rest in, you know, because she was a woman, of course, so rest in peace to her. You know, I mean, the, the ladies, you know what I'm saying, uh, you know, played a heavy part in this, you know, um, in terms of really the valets. Of course, who can forget Baby Doll, one of the fattest white girls ever? <laughs> Baby dog. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, I mean, Precious. Yo. <laughs> I mean, them valets, dude. I mean, you have Precious with Jimmy Garvin, Miss Elizabeth. I mean, yo. Missy like, Hyatt. Yeah, Missy Hyatt, man. You have Sonny. Before and after. You know, uh, yeah, man. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 
you know, but it was always like, just like we see in the rap videos, man, you know, you always got to have the baddest joint on your arm, you know, like to really, you know, just like set that tone, man. And it, Get that I mean, attention. You know, it, it, yeah. You know, I mean, hey, you know what, you guys, the, now, you know, uh, going to for the gear for a minute. Mm-hmm. We want to talk about this point now, you know, before we going on with uh, the Monday Night Wars, I want to talk about the wrestling commentary that you see on YouTube, like the Wrestling Bios channel. Now, I want to plug that. Right. Quick because, man, one thing okay. that's dope about that channel is the guy, I mean, it, it, you, might, you might get a, a little bit used to his accent, but the way he choreographs the stories, he tells the bios of behind the storylines and characters, it's very dope package. And yeah, well there's a lot of stuff out. on that channel that I didn't even know. Like when they talk about yeah, character right. development of the Black Heart character with Owen Hart, that's what really made me a fan of that. Yeah, yeah rest in hey, peace, you know, Owen. Getting rest in peace, Owen. Rest in peace to Owen. And getting to know him, that dude works hard, man. Like he deserves all the credit in the world, man. Like he, a lot of dedication. Like sometimes he can't even talk, like because you know he recording all of that, so you got to write the scripts, then edit it. And it's just like I know he, I know he said he's taking a little break. He, <laughs> I'm like, you deserve it, man. Like, cause you work hard, you work hard, man. And it's a great, it's quality content, man. I definitely enjoy it. I don't know if you guys ever heard of OSW, but that's another channel. The old, um, this old school wrestling review. It's like a video podcast type of thing. It's more humorous, but it's it, it's informative as well too. And I like yeah, how he man. broke down the Monday Night Wars. And, it, and if anything, it made me go back on the network to seeing some of the stuff I may have overlooked. It's like the atrocious booking of Hogan with Superman and niggas in 96. I was like, when, I, oh, when yeah. they showed the one where he put the figure four on two different wrestlers at the same time, I was like, yo, <laughs> come on, man. That's, that Superman booking is crazy. And I like the humor. Yeah, that they got out of control. Too. Yeah, man, you know, and uh, we you look at it, product. you know, yeah, I mean, because when you look at it, you know, back in the day, you know, we made a comparison to now, you know, you have the artists, like, that were really, really big, you know, like back in the day with Hogan, I mean, how long, yo, King, how long did Hogan hold that belt back in the day, like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, but like, he, because he was yeah, he held it for at least corporate. about four years. <laughs> yeah, he held it for a while. <laughs> But he went a long time without getting paint clean, Beaver. Like, it wasn't until Austin Warrior beat him that he was like, he got beat one, two, three. Because even when he lost the title, he lost it with the whole fake referee shenanigans thing. Like, the first time he <laughs> lost clean, at, it was the <laughs> the evening. They had the two happenings with, uh, with um, Teddy Biasi, you know, like Andre the Giant when they stole the title from Hogan. Yeah, man, you know, but that was crazy because, you know, uh, the, the Andre the Giant storyline was real crazy because, you know, it's funny because when you're looking at the time or, you know, you're looking at how things was passed because, you know, of course, you know, about how the, the, the mantle was passed, like when, you know, uh, Hogan talked about with Andre, you know, about Hogan was always grateful to Andre because he was like, Andre didn't have to do that for me to pass the torch for me to go ahead and, um, you know, be the next guy, you know, but, you know, that was like when Hogan, you know, spotty slammed Andre, you know, that was like the passing of the torch, just like, like four or five years later, you know, with Ultimate Warrior, when, uh-huh. you know, when Ultimate Warrior beat him, and, you know, that still, even if it is, even if it was rehearsed, you know, that ending Niggas is the perfect... Yeah, it was it was just he beautiful. Did. Like even though when he when body you... slammed Andre, it it was yeah. like the world stopped. Yeah. And I mean, of course, when you know Warrior beat Hogan, and to see Hogan realize that he lost, but he got up and he looked at the belt, and then he gave it to Warrior. I mean, that was just touching, you know, because it's like, yo, he's like, yo, dude, like you next up, go do it. Word, you know, go do what you gotta do. Yeah, you know, but you know, dog, you know, but we, and I don't want to get, you know, too, too deep on it, but when you look at the business aspect of it, you know, as beautiful as it was because it was such a part of our nostalgia, it really gave us those memories. 
you know, we got to be real. When we saw movies like Beyond the Mat, you know, when we really saw what oh, goes yeah. on behind the scenes, you know, it really showed us. I mean, like, you know, shout out to arguably the greatest actor in wrestling history, Jake Roberts, because they said that was part of Jake's <laughs> charm because they were like, the trick is with Jake is that you never knew if he was in character or out of character, you know, because that was just who he was, you know, and of course they went in the back story about his father, Grizzly Smith, and then that whole situation with, uh, yeah. I'm not going to spoil it, but for those who saw the documentary, you saw that story, and it was like, I saw that, I was like, whoa. And um, you could understand why Jake is the way he was, you know, in terms of that. Yeah. You know, I mean, and uh, but you know, and then we then we saw, and it, yo, it, it's crazy, dog, because y'all y'all we we saw how, in terms of how it parallels with the music industry about how dirty the music industry is. I mean, the Marshall yeah. screw job with Brett, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, you yeah, know, I'm still not over um, that. Yeah, you know, because Brett was. I mean, the way they had the, delivered they had the inter- pretty much, they put the no fly zone on HBK for 10 years after that, man. <laughs> they put the no fly zone on him and Triple H. They couldn't even come to Canada. Yeah. Y'all better, be guarded. Y'all better have a lot of security out here. But it's wild because I remember Shawn Michaels when he was with Marty Zanetti with the Midnight Rockers when they were in the old AWA. Shout out to ESPN because they used to run those old wrestling shows back in the day. From the you know, show, uh, you know, yeah, man. You know, of course they had Chris Adams. You know, all those guys. You know, uh, you know, um, and it was like with the Rockers. You know, Marty Jannetty and uh, you know, because that was like their answer for the Rock and Roll Express. And back in the day, you could see that Shawn Michaels was like talented. You know, uh, but you didn't know until like the mid nineties when he got to W you know, the WWF that he was like really the early nineties, mid nineties when he got there, like he was really gonna be that guy. You know, yeah, but um it's he grew into it though. Me. Same thing with Brett. Like how yeah. we watched them grow into grow into it. They came a long way. Yeah. yeah, yeah especially man. when it was considered at that time it all mattered about size and how tall your stature was. Yeah, yeah, you're you right. Know, that but, was uh, a big man. It was a big time for the big men. Yeah, and it's kind of like how it is cool. now because you know we're going from the over the top characters to more so the indie style workers. And what do you see the business looking at today, man? The in comparison to how it was before. Like, do you see evolving? Like, you know, you have another, you have New Japan, AEW. Uh, what's that another league? Uh, MLW, Impact, they still Impact around by they hang about three. Impact Wrestling. Yeah, they just yeah. got nah, they just got a um they just started a partnership with AEW. Okay. So that's that's gonna okay. help them out. Um they Kenny Omega was on there this week and they got the biggest ratings on their show that they ever had from Kenny Omega being on there for that. Not like not like the ratings they had back in the day, but on their new channel they got the biggest ratings. Since Kenny um Kenny Omega showed up for the um for the show for the first time, but yeah um I think AEW is gonna help the business get better because for a long time WWE ain't have no real competition like it was just it was other companies but they, it wasn't nobody like making no real noise. But with New Japan and AEW, I'm hoping that influences them to get back on it and start putting out something that's good because. They got, like, one of the best rosters they ever had. WWE got so much talent. It's not even funny, man, like, because they, they, they get everybody, like, all, all the people that's good, they sign them up. So if they wanted to put on the best shows possible, they could. I'm hoping that they, they get the fire a little under them and they start letting these people do what they can do. But I still watch everything, and the AEW been bringing it lately. This thing came back. Like, it's a lot going on, so I'm hoping that they – WWE kind of get on the ball. But with no fans in the audience, it's kind of hard for everybody right now to really put on, like, crazy good shows because, you know, the fans are so important. They can create the atmosphere. with no. It's like it's basically they wrestling with no atmosphere. 
Yeah. You know, it's, you know, a little, and, and, it's a little bit better now than it, than it was before because when this thing first started, it was awful. Like, they had my man yeah, when Stone Cold empty. in the ring cutting the promo, asking the, nobody the did. audience with no crowd, give me a hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't good. It made him look crazy. Yeah, you, you know, know probably that's why he ain't though. come back since. <laughs> And, you know, probably... you know, and it's crazy, y'all, because like King said, and like you mentioned, all you know, you know, I remember what, when TNA started around what late two thousand one, two thousand two. So you you got to think that this is a situation. This is like starting an independent record label because you're going against the majors. Because by mm-hmm. that time, you know, well, when you look at what happened with the deal, what happened with WCW in late two thousand and the right early two thousand two thousand and one. Well, basically, you know, Turner Network Television came under, uh, Turner Broadcast came under new ownership, I believe, uh, if I got my story right. And um, they just, the new ownership decided they didn't want to put wrestling on. So basically, you know, WCW was out in the cold. And that's when Vince McMahon came in and did the ultimate power move. Look, he straight, uh, he yeah. both should ignite the game because he bought his competition. He bought you know, the course, competition. You know, at ETW. Yeah. Yeah, you know, ETW. Yeah, because basically they had no, because there was no equity in it because they didn't have any backing. So they needed somebody to get it. It's like basically they had, they they couldn't negotiate because there was nobody to negotiate with in terms of who Not, could buy them out. It was, terms of, it was other people that wanted it, though. But they didn't have right. any TV. Like, they didn't have no TV show. So right. once they have a TV show, it's like, what could you buy? Like, ain't nobody else that could really buy it and do anything with it. So Vince came right up in there. Like, I'll take that. Yeah, and I mean, of course, with, you know, ECW, um, I actually have the book, you know, The Rise and Fall of ECW, because, you know, ECW started in, like, 1994. I didn't get hip to it until around, much as my cousin told me about it, around 95 but i didn't really start watching it till like early 96 because it had been on the air for like a year on a local access channel out here and i saw this shit i was like whoa i was like dude shout out to joey styles who is one of the greatest announcers i have ever seen do this um but you know yeah i'm the back in his day like, when he yeah. was doing ECW shows by himself, like, most of the time, calling all yeah, that action. I mean, and the dude pay-per-views was too. Joey. Three-hour pay-per-views, yeah. man, was calling pay-per-views. And he's the only one in wrestling history in terms of that trivia, in terms of wrestling trivia, he's the only one who has ever called a pay-per-view by himself. Shout-out to Joey Styles, because he is one of the greatest Well, shout-out to Joey. Um and he would, you know, he would when, be in, like be in tune with all the storylines, like put everybody in over the way he's supposed to. Like, yeah, he was on point. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, when you look yeah. at what happened with, you know, Paul, Paulie Dangerously, you know, the problem was, and I read the book, because the book broke down, like, the whole story in terms of just how Paulie's vision in terms of the company was great in terms of, because he had the talent that could compete, and he went the levels that, WWF would never even Yeah I'm going to call it WWF He went to the places that they never Would have even thought of because there was No they basically were An independent operation you know so They didn't have to worry about you know Sponsor you know a lot of these Corporate sponsors but Unfortunately um, when we Get to the seriousness of it with the business Aspect like any business We know in hip hop how many Labels have we seen in the business Uh fall apart because the business was not taken care of properly. Unfortunately, that's what happened to ECW. The business was not taken care of properly. Yeah, they, you know what's cold, they too, start, um, start getting Go expensive. Ahead. Go ahead, King. Yeah, I was saying that if you really look at it, Paul Lee, he changed the content game in wrestling forever. Because yeah, he did. You look at back in the day, man, like both WCW and WWF was looking bad. Everybody had the weird gimmicks. I mean, WWF, they had, what? what's the dude's name, bro? I mean, you had Joint the Clown, you had Quang, you had Dead mm. on the Bitch Shit. Dude, the dumpster. You had 
Duke the Dumpster, Adam Bomb. Bob it was Hollywood. terrible, man. Sparky Plug. Sparky Plug. Yeah. See, WCW, it was no better because you had Hulk Hogan beating up the Dungeon of Doom and the Horseman by himself every oh, week. Oh, man. So, oh, man. <laughs> it was nothing real. Of, it was nothing really. Paul E. came through and brought the realism in. And, it, and what he did was they didn't have oh, the boy, big budget back. presentation. Exactly. Like, they didn't have the pyro, they didn't have the the big production value, but they had the best content. It was gritty. Like, that's how hip-hop exactly. was around that time, like that. That hardcore grittiness that brought it, like, you know what I mean? Brought it back. When everybody was deep, brought that, you had that Nas, you had that, that Wu-Tang, that Biggie, like, that bringing it. Biggie was a little, you know what I mean? Not as gritty, gritty like everybody else, but you know what I mean, like, as far as just spitting. That's like that ECW ground. And then they, you know, WWE and WCW try to copy it. But the NWO was good, too, because that kind of was different. That was a different type of thing, too, when it came out. The invasion, when they had anybody coming over there. Yeah, yes, you sir. know, and, um, you know, one thing about it, I think, with ECW, where they bought the game was something that it was just straight balls out action, you know, because... You know, uh, when we were watching it during that time, you know, we had the, you know, of course, they had the BWO, you know, the Blue Meanie, Stevie Richards, you know. Um, because when you look at it, a lot of those guys were, you know, of course, Raven, who was Scotty Flamingo back in the day at WCW. Johnny Polo. You know, um, yeah, Johnny Polo. <laughs> you know, I mean, so, I mean, you're seeing these guys come in that were already in other federations that pretty much kind of went the independent route, got with a, you know, a, a organization that was really, um, it was just raw. You know what I'm saying? They just, I mean, some of those ECW matches are just legendary when you saw it. I mean, Taz, I mean, you had guys, they had underground hitters like Taz. I mean, from straight out of Red Hook, you know, Brooklyn. And, I mean, Taz was just straight vicious. I was like, <laughs> You know, Taz, they, I mean, they, they like, yeah, it was like taking yeah. people from other places and giving them like a, that that real feel like Bam Bam Bigelow when they brought him over there. He was like a rest whole entire Bam different Bam. character. Yeah. yeah, rest in peace, Bam Bam. Same thing with Shane Douglas. On the other programs, he's the pretty boy and all that. Dean Douglas, you bring him to ECW, he's the franchise. And you had the gangsters. The word, the game, yeah, New man. Jack, Mustafa. Yeah, and we go back to Bloody I mean, Summer 96, was... man, with that blood feud with the gangsters and eliminators. That was crazy. They would get, it was on on site every time. They yeah, locked yeah, in. yeah, it was. My man Cronus. Yeah, rest in peace, John Cronus, man. You know, uh. I mean, but the gang, I mean, the Eliminators, you know, of course, yo, who can remember when Saturn started getting his shine a little bit when they moved him to WC, when, of course, remember when uh, Raven and all them, they got their little buzz. Yeah, the they, moved, they went over, Yeah, they moved him to WCW, but it was like, that just wasn't <laughs> nothing. I was like, man, I'm like, who? I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, stick boy. I'm like, I'm like what, what the hell? What, 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 what they doing? <laughs> <laughs> now nah, Raven had a nice little. I think the beginning of it started off good when he had Kidman and mm-hmm. all of them. Um, Scotty yeah, Riggs, Billy he had Kidman, the whole yeah. thing he, when he messed up his eye. Scotty Riggs eye, and he started wearing the eye patch. Yeah, yeah, it was original. Yeah, he had a whole little nice little story. So it started off good, but then you know with everything in WCW, they start they start getting too they start doing it too long and they start adding too many people to it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, now, now tripping again, we talk about the Monday Night Wars here, and you brought up the NWO and how they changed the course, and Stone Cold and the Big Man feud kicked the course. What was one moment where you guys realized that WCW wasn't going to come back? And I'm going to tell y'all mine. The minute when Mick Foley flew off the cage, I knew WCW wasn't going to come back from that. They can't get too well. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I think for yeah. me it was like when the um 
when it's like they had The Rock and Stone Cold and Kurt Angle with like Triple H, all the people start stepping up because they had Stone Cold, they had The Undertaker. Shawn Michaels had one away, but then that's all he had for a second. Then you know the people, The Rock start elevating, Triple H start elevating, Kurt Angle come out of nowhere, they get Jericho. It's like they started having too many people. Oh my own, nah, the show is too deep. Like, it's too many of them. Yeah, you know, and um, it, it just, you know, as you saw that those dynamics change, man, I mean, the whole era, you know, of course, when we started seeing Hogan, you know, when we saw Hogan do the heel turn, and it was like, it was crazy, because, you know, we didn't expect that, I mean, that we really saw to see the posse and up and all that, I mean, look, they were just like, look, the NWO would just swallowed up everybody. Me and King always laugh off the air about it in terms of like, yo, NWO would just straight beat your team. And then they join afterwards, man. <laughs> 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 they were like, man, I'm trying to get no ass whooping. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, yo. It's spray painted every night. They like, yo, I'm tired of it. Yeah, man. He's like, I'm joining up. <laughs> I don't want to be beat up no more. Man, but, but I mean, we look at cool it. Though, though, was, then they spawned, the coolness of the NWO spawned into two clicks, actually. It created the Wolf Pack and it created DX. Yeah. True. True that. Because you, uh, you figure Dynamite Kid, he would end up going back to WC, uh, WWF. He would end up going back. You know, uh, he would end up leaving, you know, uh, because, of course, you know, uh, Scott Hall, you know, which was Razor Ramon back in the day. And, then, you know, because it's still crazy when we see, you know, of course, Kevin Nash, it was, D, you know, uh, Diesel. And then, I mean, that fateful Monday night back in 1996, 95, 96, when they just all of a sudden walk up in there. So we thinking like, yo, WWE, they actually like, what up for them? And then we find nah, out. No, but they like, did, it it's just, crazy how they did it. They did it in waves. Yeah, ahead, like the first, um, Scott Hall came, popped up. You know, yo, what's Scott Hall doing here? He's like, yo, I got a surprise. Then next thing you know, Kevin Nash was like, whoa, ho, ho, who next? And then the way they tied Hulk Hogan in, it made so much sense. Like, yeah, the cold part about it, the cold part about that was we were sitting there because. That was the ultimate match we wanted to see. We wanted to see dream matches. We wanted because you know. We had the, the wrestling magazine. I think it was called the PWI. Pro they had yeah. yeah. It was a kayfabe type magazine. It had, and they had WCW versus WWF. And that was like their highest selling issue ever. Because it played on to the, man- the fantasy matchups that people wanted to see. Definitely. Yeah. Now, um, now, oh, I wanted to ask you this question. We want to ask you this question as well because, um, like I said, we uh, this is this interview was just unbelievably just one just one of the funnest, most enjoyable we've ever done in a series of fun, <laughs> enjoyable interviews. I mean, we're loving you being on the show right now. We wanted to is, I'm, yeah, get you on. It's a lot of wrestling talk, man. This is dope. Man. <laughs> yeah, we we wanted to get your opinion on how another parallel of the business comes in in terms of where you have uh, anticipation for projects, you know, that we've seen in hip hop like the same in wrestling um, in terms of like, we look at the situation with Hogan and Flair when they finally got it on in the ring. But this was like, what was that King? Like what? 90, that was like what? 90, what year was that? When they finally locked up. So they had the, they they had the one with, they kind of did it in WWF when uh-huh. Rick Flair came and he was the real world champion. But the one right. you might be the one I think you're talking about is the WCW one. That was in like ninety four. Right. Ninety four, like right. yeah. 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 five maybe. And, and, right. Right. And of course, you know, shout out to ESPN for doing the thirty for thirty documentary on Ric Flair because they broke it down in terms of when yeah. you know, those two finally did lock up. But some people felt like it was like maybe six, seven years too late in terms of where the peak, the pinnacle was. How do you yeah, feel about you it when you have that. Yeah, how do you feel about it from a musical rap perspective when you look at some artists in terms of, you know, how a lot of these albums, you know, like, or artists are anticipated, but it's like it it takes so long with the business before, like, before it finally drops, like, 
you know, it's not what we thought it would be when it finally hit. So nowadays, I think this that's less of a problem nowadays because if an artist really wants to be active, now with mm-hmm. everything being so accessible, you could just put out a quick project or a little EP. But you know, sometimes your 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 real project is is it's just like it's waited on, and you're right, it's like a lot of bureaucracy, red tape. You can't get you can't get it done. But I'm like I was thinking, as long as you nowadays you can do any, you can do a lot to engage your fans. You don't gotta just have music. You gotta have something else too. Like, and that's another thing I'm trying to get. Like, but now you could Twitch, you could Twitch stream, or you could podcast, or do anything to still keep your name out there in the meantime. So, or like, and keep building the matchup. If we can still use the wrestling analogy, like, even though it's not coming, right, it's right. for a couple years down the line. You could just do stuff to build the matchup. Like the torch could be like a promo. You could do merch. You could do little features. Anything really just to keep your name out there is what it's about at this point. Because this world is so digital. It's not like how it was when you would wait for an album to drop so you could run to the store and copy. Now it's the, it's the same. Like copying stuff digitally is cool, but it's not the same, man. Like it's, and with the streaming platforms give you the um, option to just stream it. It's different. It's not the same as where you had to go to the store and buy it to hear the album. Like that was that was fire. I miss those days. Like, <laughs> yeah, man. You know, and it's not crazy in terms red, of when... it's more red tape with the content too, man. Because now with things going digital, they could quickly track down and change up a lot of things. Just like even when you went oh, to the album, yeah. they missing certain songs. Off these classic albums And you like Well that just kills the experience Yeah you're right Yeah And you know that happens, I mean, it's it's Sometimes people projects Is missing from there completely Like you looking for Like yo Where, where the hell is the album at Like it's just not even on there Yeah like, you look at, It's like you look at LL's album Like if you get an LL album Off of there Like you get Mr. Smith and it's missing. I shot your remix. You like what? That's the reason yeah, why we copied it. Just... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, but it's always about getting that main, that big, that big. Uh, you know, it's always about being larger than life in terms of when you really want to capitalize on. I think that's what made wrestling and hip hop. You know, there's so much alike. I mean, when we look at some of the characters that were just so over the top. I mean, if we had to make an analogy of it. You know, we really have to break it down. We could look at the four horsemen being like the Wu Tang. You know, we could oh, look at yep. we could look at like Ted DiBiase being Cash Money. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you know, oh. you know, in terms of the Bling era. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, we could look at you know uh, the Wild Samoans. You know, uh, Samoan SWAT team like the Booyah Tribe. You know, rest in peace, Gangster Ridge. You know, I mean, yeah, rest in peace. Yeah. You, you know. Uh, you know, we we could see. I mean, you look at we could look at Junkyard Dog like DMX. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the the characters in you know in terms of how they parallel each other, you know, is endless. You know, uh, in terms of how these guys really moved and the attitude that they you know Hold on, really. Can we do the Can we do the Bret Hart Cameron because of the pink? Yeah, ah. yeah, the pink. The pink. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could do. Yeah, we bring in the pink, you know, because of course, you know, he was the first to do that. I mean, I can give y'all a good one. I can give y'all a good one right here. I'm gonna give uh. y'all Hollywood Hogan and Donald Trump. <laughs> 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 look, 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 look. We, look, I, I do you one better. Ric Flair, Puff Daddy, the style, the profile, and all of that. Oh, okay. <laughs> You know, yeah. look. Let's figure another one. I got a good, I got, I got a good one here. Even though uh. he, ain't, even though his character has changed to where people accepted him now, but at this time, I would probably say Takashi and Roman Reigns. Oh, Just based on how oh. bad it makes people. <laughs> oh, oh wow! Damn, oh, Roman wow. telling. Roman out here telling. I can see. Yeah, but- this before he was telling, because he was already <laughs> hated and despised anyway. The same way Roman Reigns was just, just, just they couldn't stand him. They 
they couldn't stand him at all. All right, what y'all think about this one, right? What y'all think about this one right here? Uh-huh. EPMD and the British Bulldogs. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Because they technically fired both of them, and you could take them apart, and they still fire. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's a nice one right here. Yeah. I mean, it definitely, uh, it definitely, you know, the parallels are crazy in terms of how, you know, you see, you know, what was going on in that industry, man. I mean, you know, uh, and, and just, you know, but, you know, it's also, too, to see a lot of these guys really move on from certain levels, man. I mean, um, how would you say in terms of where, you know, um, you know, it's still, you know, in terms of how it's changed, man, I mean, because now, you know, um, you know, we're, we've seen it move in so many different ways now from its peak. You know, a lot of times, you know, same way a lot of, you know, old school hip hoppers say, you know, that new hip hop isn't what it once was, you know, because the nostalgia was totally different. Um, how do y'all see wrestling in terms of where, you know, do you think we'll ever get back to that era that it was at its peak, or do you think that's kind of just maybe once in a lifetime that we will see it do what it did? Yeah, I think that a lot of that had to do with the accessibility of it because wrestling being on TV used to be an event. Like, I used to have to plan my weeks around when wrestling was coming on so I could make sure I didn't miss nothing because you missed the episode, that was it. You might get a recap on the next episode, but you not. if you miss it, you miss it. Like, you're going to hear about it the next day in school about anything you miss. So... Because it doesn't have that feeling, like if you miss something, you can DVR it, you can watch it when you want to. You get, it's wrestling everywhere. It's more wrestling used to come on TV like three or four times a week, and that was good. Now you can watch wrestling every hour of the day if you want to. Like, so I think because it's so accessible, same thing with music. Like new albums would be dope. You would, but like it's like it seemed like somebody would like drop a new album every week now. So that's why like, I mean, it's, it's, everything is so much. It's the it's an era of excess. It's a bunch of everything where it used to be limited, and you used to wish for more. But now that we got more, it's like damn, we wish it for less. Like, you know. And also, now, when, also due to the corporations how they see it now, because the more content you pump out, the more money you make, and you also see with. A lot of YouTube and content creators, that's why you see these guys, like, doing eight to nine videos a day because they figure the more content they make, the more money they get. So they figure they profit off their oversaturation. Just flood the market, right? Yes, sir. Definitely. Now, now one thing, uh, because you are, you know, an MC, you know, you're a hard-working dude in the industry, and you know you're you know you're on the crowd. Uh just like a lot of times in terms of a lot of wrestlers come in, you know, shout out to the some of the teachers, you know, uh because we can't talk about, you know, wrestling without giving, you know, uh love and respect to all the teachers, you know, that came in the game. You know, shout out to, you know, Fritz Von Eric of the Von Eric family, shout out to Stu oh, Hart, yeah. shout out to guys like, you know, George South for the yeah. job. Yeah, Greg Ganya, you know, well, and Vern Ganya, you know, Vern Ganya, yeah, Vern Ganya. you know, uh, you know, uh, and uh, um, I mean, of course, you know, of course, um, George South, who was a jobber for a lot of years, but they say in terms George of the wrestling South. business, George South is like they say George South is probably the most. Uh, they like if you are if you need the fundamentals of wrestling in terms of they like George South is probably the best teacher you will ever have who really, yep. really understands the game. You know, shout out to Al Snow, of course, you know, who's an accomplished, who's one of the greatest wrestling instructors as well, who was on MTV. Killer Kowalski. Enough. Yeah, Killer Kowalski. You know, all these guys, you know, all these teachers, you know, um, you Jim know, Cornette. in terms of it. Jim Cornette, you know. What do a lot of these, artists that you see coming into the game today really have to understand about the dedication and time you have to put into really the art of them scene. The same way that these wrestlers here in terms of becoming, you know, pro wrestlers. It's hard to make it's hard to even make that case anymore because now a lot of these new dudes, you hear them, 
you see they song, they song do good. You hear them do an interview, they like, oh yeah, I've been rapping for like six months. I've been rapping for a year. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like you want to tell, you want to preach that to the choir. But I know when I was young, if somebody old was telling me something like that, and I'm seeing my peers pop from not even showing, like not even even structuring the song the right way. It's just whatever a vibe. If a song be for like a minute, minute forty five seconds. And uh, right. so it's like you want to tell people that, but honestly, it's whatever the people want. Because with the world being the way it is, if you could find your audience, if you could get it to your audience and make that expand, then you can pop with pretty much anything. Apparently, like, that's what it seems like is happening. Like, sorry I sound so discouraged about that, but, like, it's the truth, man. You see what's going on out here, man. Like, yeah. You know, uh, you see these people coming think... in, and you see it's like they really honestly, you can tell that they don't take it as seriously as maybe some of the worst myths, like a train of like a newer joint, like a lot of the new people, like a train of Lucas. You see how serious he take it, and then you see how right. the other people where you be like, oh, they don't even, and you see it's a struggle for him because I even heard him saying the other day he don't want to be known as like a rapper, rapper. He think it's it's not good, but. You are what you are, man. You should, and this is a game that you should have to feel discouraged from being known as being good at what you do. Like that's crazy. It was just a kind well, of yeah, the way yeah, that it was. And it started around the two thousands when you know everybody started being on that. I'm not a rapper. I'm a hustler, Steve. And yeah, you start like, taking away from the skill. Yeah, and it's kind of like. These dudes don't want to be known as rappers. I'm like, all right, niggas, you don't want to be known as a rapper. Then go back to the block. Yeah. Yeah. As long you as know, you're but using I the think... arts, you should respect it. As long as you're using the tools. Yeah, but you know. Oh, I yeah, I just make pictures, tools. but I'm not a painter. Nah, if you paint, <laughs> you got a paintbrush, you're a painter. What like, you talking about? <laughs> you got watercolors in the easel, you're a painter, nigga. Oh, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> You know, but I think also... I'm not really a painter, that, though. <laughs> you know, but I think I think where it changed, too, y'all, and when, like King said, you know, when um, in the 80s, you know, well, the 90s, when it really started, in the mid-90s, late 90s, because what you saw the scene was more of an emphasis on the street aspect. Because, of course, hip-hop at its core is a street culture. So there became more of this uh, premium on really, really branding yourself as a street guy. Now, we know certain individuals, you know, like shout out to, of course, one of your brethren, you know, Queensbridge Houses out there in Queens, you know, Cormega, you know, um, when he dropped his, doing his uh, you know, on straight out of QB off the QB compilation album, you know, he said, I'm a hustler oh. slash rapper. You know, I mean, you know, dudes that were like really from the street. You know, of course, DMX, you know, uh, you know, taking it to the West Coast, you know, rest in peace, the late, great Mac Dre, you know, um, I mean, these were street dudes who, <laughs> who were rapping, <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, they were, they were street dudes first and rap, rap was second, you know what I'm saying, but it's like, they were real, you know, but, um. But that's what I'm saying, <laughs> the people you mentioned, it, it, it stands out because it's authentic, and people taking right. that, and when, once it got to the point where the authentic isn't being like where the like when it's not authentic, it's still being recognized as authentic to the masses. That's the problem because then everybody start chasing it. Like, oh, I could just say this. Yeah, that was really not a yeah. lot of focus on. That's because bars don't really matter anymore, man. I mean, it used to be a time where you could just spit. And you or your concern was making a fan or turning that person to a fan to where they paid this little today. But now, the game done went uh-huh. to 60 to where the producer, the nigga that made the beat, he getting more recognition. Yeah. yeah. Get you a catchy little hook on there. That's what they listening for your melodies, not your bars. What's going on, son? It's not singing. It's hip hop, man. Like. Y'all want to check my melody, like, nah, like, not like how Rakim was talking about it, like, a different way, like, it's not the same type. We talking about, like, my harmonization and all that, like, nah, listen to the bars. 
Yeah, you know, and it's just it's different now, man, because I think where we're looking at hip hop now, you know, it's something that it's become more of a commodity rather than a real uh, I think representation of the culture and that's not to say that the culture doesn't, you know, exist because it still is alive as well. But like you said earlier, or when you're looking at the accessibility, social media really coming into play now. There's an opportunity from an aspect of reaching an audience that a lot of people did not have before in terms of really being able to really show themselves and brand themselves. So it's not, you know, um, you know, it's like, I mean, we look at it from back in the day with wrestlers. Imagine how back in the day, you know, you really, really, really had to stand out before you got that opportunity to really, really, really shine. Because, I mean, of course, back in the day, like Word. wrestling, you didn't get, um, you were not built up to be a main eventer, you know, because, uh, I mean, back in, like, remember back in the day at CBS when they would have, like, you know, the Saturday night show, which was, like, the the little studio show, and that was kind of like where you would, you would kind of see the new guys come in to really kind of get themselves up to show that they could be a main get eventer. start making a and name it, for themselves, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah because that was, yeah, because they were giving you that. Uh, they were giving you that. It's like that was your. That was like your. That was like your amateur night to a degree. That was like at the club. You know what I'm saying? You get that chance to really kind of get out there. Okay, this is what you're going to do on a small stage. You know, we're going to see what you really got. Build it up a little bit, and then we, you know, we move you on to the uh, the bigger stage. Being the jobber. Yeah. Well, the jobbers were the jobbers because you always had the guys that they had to that they had to see who this new face was that they felt like okay maybe this guy can be the uh, you know that can be the face of it. But they saw this guy because you know we would just see the dudes by the time they got on TV. You know we didn't see them behind the scenes in terms of the production meetings. You know in terms of like saying well yo yo son is pretty nice with this. You know maybe he got a chance to maybe really become a big name in the game, you know, but, you know, so we'll just, you know, like with Z-Man, Tom Zink, where, you know, when they started giving him, you know, that little push here and there, you know, kind of putting him out there to see what he would end up in, you know, of, uh, remember like back in the day, um, on on Monday Night Pro? Yeah, like remember, <laughs> like remember back in yeah, like y'all remember back in the day on a uh, Monday Nitro when they would have, uh, like when they were kept showing all those, like they have all them dudes, like, like Mark Gendrak, Mark Gendrak, Gendrak, and Sean O'Hare, and all those guys, like they were just yeah, the sitting new, in the, the in new the, breed, yeah, the new blood. Yeah, they was like, you know, they were just sitting in the, they were just sitting in the stands watching. They, they just tell, you know, uh, Bischoff, and then we're talking about Tony Schiavone was talking about, you know, these are going to be the new guys that's going to be coming in, you know. So we were like waiting for these dudes, you know. And then of course you had guys like Glacier, you know what I'm saying? When they were running promos for so Glacier, zero. we were like, yo. Yeah, so zero. Like, yeah, Glacier. Like, who is this dude, Glacier? Like, yo, who this dude? You know, he takes a Glacier. You know, it's wild. We're like, yeah, it's wild how he got away with a lot of that stuff, man. Even with going back with the Robo Cop, when he came, when he pulled up at uh, Capital, the Capitol, the Capitol on Combat in 1990. Then, if you really look at that, yeah. WCW got away with a lot of shit, man. I remember when they did <laughs> WCW Saturday Night, and they had. The whole intro, you look at that introduction to WCW Saturday Night, it was straight from the Terminator. I was like, yo, they swagger jacket on the low. <laughs> <laughs> See, of course, now, you know, the infamous, like the, um, most famous like the set, the most famous swagger jack was the DDP thing with Nirvana. Yeah. They got That's a the most of famous one. They got a couple of those. Reagan theme is a swagger jacket, um... What's the name? Uh, Mr. Sir, come as you are? Yeah. The Nevada yeah. one. Raven theme is the same. It's like a, a copy of that. It's the DDP one. It's something else, too. Well, Raven. Well, Chris Jericho. Yeah, Raven's, uh, well, Raven's. Uh, we Chris had, Jericho uh, is Raven Flow. Yeah, 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 Ra- yeah, exactly. Cause, yeah, because the thing is, and for those. And for those that don't um, know music, because we're gonna, because this is what we do on Off the Cuff Radio in terms of we give y'all all types of games from the hip hop to the legal. Musically, yeah, we ain't gonna try to get you locked of, up. No, we don't want you to get locked <laughs> up or sued. But when you're looking at it from a musical perspective, they have what I believe is called the three fifths notation rule, and this is the same rule that got Pharrell and Robin Thicke caught up. And that whole, you know, lawsuit with the gay estate. You've know, got to give it up. 
you know, a versus, you know, a blur line. Because the thing is, the harmonics, the melody was like, I think it was like, in terms of the notation, in terms of the melody was like, I think like basically three-fourths right along the lines of what the original song was. This is where you come up with what they call interpolations in terms of where you play the notes and the melodies in different parts of the song. Because there are only 12 notations in the whole theory of music. There's only 12 notations, but it's the arrangement in terms of how you play those notes, and there have to be variations that are not specific in terms of the same as the original song. Like what you were saying are about the even flow with uh, Chris Jericho, that's exactly what that was, because if you know the melody of it, you would hear the guitar part come in, but they would play it at a whole different pitch in terms of where that main <laughs> chorus, that main break, that main break comes in for the guitar in terms of the chorus, you know where it meets, oh, right. like even flow. But they play it at a whole different key. That is not well, the same as what. Enough, and WCW had enough clout to back it up in case lawsuits came. So when right. Vince came out there and bought it out, he won't pay for none of that shit. <laughs> oh nah, they had to get all new things. Like nigga, I'm not paying I'm not paying Mikhail Talica no two million per per appearance for that. Y'all want to get another thing. It's your new song. New song like it. Like <laughs> I mean look, I mean but look at how but it's also too when we look at it in uh from that perspective, um, you know, because it's also another parallel of it how they rebrand people. Like, remember with The Undertaker, how they used to have him as, like, the graveyard, like, you know, the graveyard killer, and then they reinvented him as the American badass who was a biker and everything. He even got Chris, I mean, Kid Rock to do a, uh original song for him and everything. I mean, look at Lex Luger when he went to the WWF back in the day. And the he ended up becoming Mr. America. Yeah, he started off as a narcissist, then he became Mr. America. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? So it's funny how they'll rebrand certain people. You know what I'm saying? In fact, bro, and on top of that, this is what people got to realize, too, with the music is what makes the character. That's where a mm-hmm. lot of people today, a lot of wrestlers today are finding it hard to connect with the audience because, man, the music is so generic. Like, your team's got to be hit. A lot of it is. Yeah. Some people got some like, good ones, be, though, but, like, for the most part, it's not. But once Jim Johnston, that's the dude that used to make music back in the day. It's like once he left, it lost a lot of his character. Yeah. Wait a minute. Jim hey, Johnston, put, he, he, used to do, he used to do, I didn't know Jim Johnston did beats for uh, of a lot of those people back in the day. Yeah, he WWE from, things. like, most of them, yeah, pretty much. Because I know like Jim the, is a hip hop producer. Jim, for those huh? that don't know out there, for those that Jim, do, do not know about Jim Johnson, that's one of the baddest white boys ever to touch a mixer in terms ever. of making beats ever. ever. That dude, ever. Jim Johnson, is bad. He that white boy, nice with it. But I did not know that he did wrestling things. I did not know that. Throughout Man, the nineties, the two thousands. <laughs> you know that boy up until wrong. like two thousand um, seventeen. <laughs> I did not know that. Yo, I just I learned something. Yeah, man. I that mean, Undertaker, I did not know the Undertaker that. theme. Undertaker theme is his. Ultimate Warrior mm. theme is his. Shawn Michaels Yo. theme is his. Um, Stone Cold theme is his. <laughs> Who else? Bret Hart. Um, anybody you think of? Kurt Angle. Chris so he Benoit. Was the one doing all, Jericho. So he was doing all the stop. So he did all the stop music for them. Uh huh. You know, also, yep. he was in like when DX the DX band performed at that WrestleMania. He did the mm-hmm. bass. He played the bass. Oh in wow! The DX band. Man, he yo, had a performance we too. Yo, and and mentioning DX, we cannot forget about you know Lemmy. Shout out to Lemmy. Rest in peace, Lemmy. Kill Mister yeah, from Motorhead when Lemmy. he did the song. You know, for uh, you know, for Triple H when he did that jam. I mean, when he was yo, out there freestyling. Man, let me, let me, let me look. In the words of, because I'm a heavy metal head too. Let me is God. Yes. 
He's out there yeah, playing solid. He made up his own. He made up some new lyrics for that. <laughs> that that was Lemmy though. Lemmy didn't care. <laughs> Lemmy gave no fuck. <laughs> so Lemmy, that's just Lemmy was just that dude. Now, um, we 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 talk so much about the fun times and the wild times, but we got to get serious in terms of the lifestyle, in terms of where you've seen hip hop go as well, because uh, beyond the mat. And we've seen, you know, um, I think the the hardest tragedy we've had to endure is over the past 25 years watching almost 200 wrestlers pass away. Um, In terms of being in this show business, because it's all show business at the end, what do a lot of artists have to understand about, you know, being in the business in terms of what it takes to the push, the, the demands, the sacrifice, and how this lifestyle, if you're not mentally prepared for it, what it can do to you psychologically and physically. I think because it comes from having the wrestlers. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. you see it. Well, I think it comes from having, like, a good foundation, like a good core family and, like, support system around you. Um, maybe even principles, like how you was raised, stuff that she was instilled in you. Cause like at the end mm-hmm. of the day, when it when it, when the fame comes, you're gonna be looking for what's real. You gotta be able to tap into like people that knew you before all of that. Cause it's gonna be a lot of people trying to come to to the situation. So I think having that that support system, you'll be able to have somebody to vent to, people that know the things that you like. Maybe saying you're going through something bad and they don't, they don't know what to do, or just I think that's big and important. And if you don't got that, it's just a lot of, <laughs> I'm not sure what else you could possibly do. But, yeah, it just comes to knowing that who you got around you and people that's going to be honest with you. Having and a solid if, you, team. Yeah. If, you was working with pe- yeah, if you was working with people, like, you got to make sure you try to stick with who you who you with, who you comfortable with. Like, I know I try to, like, with, my, my, with a barber. I ain't changed barbers in over ten years. Like I know for a fact, like when I, it been even longer than that. Like fifteen, I know when you, like I try to be loyal. Like when I get something, I sit. Like I eat the same. I try to eat the same way. Like it's consistency. So I try. So whenever things, if when things do change, I got that core foundation of what who I am, what I like to do, and how I handle things. So I think that's probably important. Yeah, you know, keep, shout keep, out to keep my family. <laughs> Yeah, you know, shout out to Del Wilk, you know, aka the Patriot, you know, and of the course Patriot. the Matt. Yeah, when he talked about the sickness in that documentary, because a lot of people really don't know the demand. One thing about the Patriot, um, you know, one thing about Beyond the Matt was, uh, and Del was one of the most compelling interviews in that documentary next to Jake Roberts, um, because he really talked about how, you know, that wear and tear on the road can really, really burn you out, about how those guys really got burned out doing it. And, you know, when you're dealing with the drug addiction, you know, the stare, I mean, you know, um, you know, we would be remiss to not mention what was going on in the 80s with the drugs during that time. You know, I mean, you know, we, you know, it was, you know, and I mean, we knew the craziness, but King and me talk about this all the time, about, you know, when this big man actually had that lawsuit filed against him in 94 about, you know, what was going on with all the drug use steroids. and the WWE yeah, yeah. Yeah, steroids. I mean, then we find out that a lot of cocaine was involved in this. It's like, you know, I mean, it was crazy. I mean, this was actually the looking the at going to no promo <laughs> I'm about to say, if you ever listen to The Warriors, you know it was some cocaine involved. Like, <laughs> Niggas hit an yeah. eight ball before 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 camera shoot. <laughs> Holy two, yeah. Holy not innocent. Holy was getting wired too. Yeah, man. Look, look, we a lot of look, we look. Crazy. Look, y- y'all y'all saw that video meme with uh, Randy and uh, Mean Gene, rest in peace to both of them, when they say, when you t- when that cocaine finally set in, because you see Randy walking up and he's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> when that cocaine finally kicked in, we was, oh, we was dead, man. I was like, that was hilarious. No, that was fun. But, uh, 
You know, but also, too, in terms of cinema, we got to shout out Mickey Roar. For what he did in The Wrestler, that was one of the most clairvoyant um, portrayals of wrestling life I have ever seen. Because up until that point, we had never seen a movie that was actually basically depicting a real drama at that that depicted the life of a wrestler in terms of what they went through. I mean, and not like that. Uh, No, not like that at all. I mean, you know, it's him as Randy Robertson, you know, I mean, we're seeing it from where he was like that dude back in the day to, you know, when the fame kind of wanes and then, of course, being being an absentee father and then, you know, trying to get back into it, and then in between we're seeing the preparation. I mean, yo, Mickey Roar, I, I did not know Mickey Roar had that level of dramatic uh, of dramatic in him to do what he did in that role. I mean, shout out to Mickey Roar, man. That was a great movie. If you, for all of out there, if you have not seen The Wrestler, you need to go see it. You gotta check it out. I was like, he had to, he had to know some wrestlers or something. Like, man, we saw have a good research team too. Yeah, that was really good. Great performance. Yeah. Yeah. He was supposed to have a match yeah. with Chris Jericho, too, but it fell through. That when same year, like, the um, wrestling came out. He was like, he didn't want to get involved because he was trying to get the academy. Together. It was like, they didn't look good for him. It wouldn't look good for him to be involved in, like, a wrestling match. So it kind of fell through. Mm-hmm. He was still at the WrestleMania, but it, he was he didn't get into a match. With, he was supposed to have a match with Chris Jericho. Right, you know, but uh, but I mean, it, it takes it's a lot, man. And I mean, but we saw like uh, if you have not for those, and we also got to shout out Vice too, man. Um, shout out to Vice. If you have not watched the docu series Vice has done on wrestlers, you know the one with New Jack. Oh man, that was just wild to watch. Lost out of the ring. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean the Bruiser Brody one, and then if you know with Chris Benoit, that was. I mean, the Chris and Wild one was just boy. I, They're I coming was... back too. They got some more episodes coming out soon. Oh, oh, Season word! Who they gonna be doing this time? Um, they have like the show in Korea. It was like a big. No, I think it wasn't Korea. It might have been. Um, it was a WCW show in Korea. They did. Is they doing um? Mm-hmm. I think they was talking about doing the Saudi Arabia story. Oh wow! Well, um, about WWE going over there. Okay. Is it just was it going to be uh, a big in depth one, or were they just going to talk about just the you know just what it was like just performing over there, or were there any like nah? Back it was like the it? one where they they were saying maybe possibly about the one where you, it was like something going over the plane. Wait, remember okay. they was like stuck over there for a couple like you never seen like they was like hostages or some some weirdness that was going on. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. I think okay. they doing the Brian I know they doing the Brian Pillman one. If they didn't do that already, I don't think. Yo, that was like crazy with Brian Pillman, man, because I mean, you know, because uh, he actually used to play football. You know, he was with the Bengals for a short time uh-huh. before he ended up before he ended up becoming a pro wrestler. But you know, they said. I mean, you know, but when Pillman just started getting, I mean, but, you know, when we started seeing, like, in the 90s, like, in the mid-90s, especially after he went to ECW, it was like, you know, we were seeing the Pillman, like, just wigging out. So we like, yo, it's like, yeah. I'm bugging. But it's like, we didn't know that, like, this dude was really, like, on drugs outside the ring. Like, crazy drugs, too. Yeah, man. You know, but I mean. LSD. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, but I mean, when you saw him in WCW back in the day, like he was really going to be that guy. Like he really was that guy who they really thought was going to be the next one to take it forward. But you know, um, stuff happens off camera that we don't know about as the fans, as the public. And then you know, it's just amazing when you see some of these guys they are there one second and then they're not there anymore. He just disappeared. You know? Yeah. You know, uh, you know. I mean, we look at guys. Rest in peace to the Rock's uncle, Yokozuna. You know, Yokozuna. Um, I think they said because there was rumors 
you know, because he died. When did Yokozuna pass away, King? Around what, 2000? Probably 90? Like, when did he pass away? Like, 99, right? Yeah, 99. Yeah, late 99, but, 2000. Yeah, because there had been rumors that he was trying to lose some of that weight because he was going to make a comeback. Because he, yeah, had he taken come back. Some, yeah, because he had taken that hiatus, and there was a rumor he was trying to lose the weight to come back, you know, but... You know, uh, Yokozuna was that dude, man, but he was, he, you know, he was big, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, it got to the point where he was too big for his own good, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, rest in peace to Yoko, the grand champion, man. For those who don't know what Yokozuna means in Japanese, it means grand champion, you know. Uh, but you he, know what's um, cool, though, is that they, they were so good with the gimmicks back then. That we didn't yeah. even know Yoko Yoshino wasn't even Japanese. And we didn't know he was even Samoan. <laughs> he was, yeah, he was Hawaiian, you know. We we didn't know that was the Rock's uncle, you know what I'm saying. We didn't know. See, was that, anyway, what they made it so dope back then was we didn't know what was a big deal then. They made, like, him speaking for the first time was a, was a big deal. And I was like, yo, yeah. this dude sounds like he's from the Bronx. <laughs> Word. <laughs> I was dumbfounded. Yeah, man. You know, I mean, of course, you know, one thing about when we've done shows like this, because we, we can't forget some of the wrestling guests we've had in the past. Of course, rest in peace, John Cronus. You know, that was, you know, when King first started this, John Cronus was his first guest. Um, first of course, first. You, know, you know, you know, we had Stevie. Yeah, yeah. We had Stevie yeah, Ray on the Ray show a couple of years Larry ago from Harlem Hill. Heat. Yeah. Stevie. Yeah, Remember when man. him and Booker T had that feud and he he took the T for Booker. <laughs> yeah. He gave it to um Ahmed Johnson. Yeah, man. He dropped the you know, T because the yeah, T ain't in you. He <laughs> <laughs> left out the yeah, T because the you... T ain't in you. <laughs> Yo, it's crazy because y'all mentioned Ahmed Johnson. And yo, like, Ahmed Johnson was supposed to be, like, that next dude. You know what I'm saying? I used to like Ahmed, too. Yeah, that, but they said... Uh, that, that feud with him in the nation, that was straight black-on-black black crime every Monday. <laughs> <laughs> and they loved it. But then they started... But then they got the biker gang and the Spanish gang in there, too. They couldn't even hide what they did. Yo, the Latin Kings got in there and the... And the uh, What's the, the Hell's Angels? The Hell's Angels. The version of the Hell's Angels. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah, man. You know, but uh, but the gang know, but that, element you know, was, made, was made everything cool, and they trying to do. I like, I like what they trying to do today with the hurt business, though. They need to let if they were yeah, smart, they need to have to run that thing like the four horses. Man. They do they protect. I know they protect Bobby Lashley. Like Lashley don't really lose no more, man. So I think they got out. They like he'd be the Ric Flair of the group. Well, maybe not from the talking perspective, but and you have MVP be the the mouthpiece, like like they doing, and have Bobby Lashley just be like the Ric Flair as far as in ring. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, one thing about it is in any business and entertainment, whether hip-hop or, you know, wrestling, whatever, movies, you always got to have that one star that is going to be the draw, you know, and I think that's, you know, like when you looked at it back in the day with Bad Boy, rest in peace to Big, you know, he was the draw, you know, when you had the Death Row days really jumping, you know, Snoop was the draw, you know, um, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, you always are going to have those labels that are really going to push, you know, back in the day with Arista, you know, Whitney Houston, rest in peace, she was like the big, you know, uh, star, you know, of course, you know, um, you know, Michael Jackson, when he was on Sony Epic, you know, CBS, he was the guy, you know, so, you know, it's always finding a way to find that market and then, you know, moving it. And the thing is being able to not only have that person, but as the, gain the market evolve being able to move them along with it because that's how you sustain commercial viability in terms of being able to really profit off of it you know uh you know because nothing stays the same forever and we we've seen this over the years you know you you know you're always looking for that next guy who's going to be or you know who's going to be able to be a 
to really take the mantle and move it forward. You know? Yeah, you definitely it's definitely about the next big thing. Definitely, man. So in terms of it, you know, so so in terms of what you've been doing with your music, or I mean, have you reached out to any wrestlers, you know, to possibly have them do some cameos on your uh, on your projects or what have you? Um, I mean, obviously, your shit is dope. So I mean, what's the what's next up for you in terms that. of really branching it? Yeah. So what's so, next in terms of really finish, reaching out? Go ahead, I did go ahead. a song with Rocky Romero um, a couple years ago, which which was fire. That was my first. Like, I ain't never heard of like doing that. Like I did a song. We did a song about the Great Muda together. So I thought that was oh, dope because he, he was work he worked in New Japan. So you know what I mean. Like, How could we not mention the Great Muda throughout this show till now? Yeah. Oh hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I did the song with him. But like I got next week is a big week. I can't say much, but like you know what I mean, if y'all are tuned, y'all y'all find out what's going on. But got some something happening. That's why I've been a little quiet on social media because of like now I got something happening. And I don't want to. You know, I like everything. I don't want to jeopardize it. I mean, I talk about right. all types of wrestling on my soul. I'm like, all right, I'm just being quiet because I can't say nothing. But, yeah, in a couple of days, you'll see what's next, man. That's what it is, man. I mean, great Muta. How could we forget the great Muta not mentioning him? Because Mu- I remember when him and Sting used to have those battles. Yo. Yeah. You know, and, of course, you know, back in the day, we got to take it before Muta because he had a father, the great Kabuki. You know what I'm saying? The yeah. Kabuki. Like, yeah. Tiger Mask. Yeah, man. Because, matter of fact, Muda, Muda actually owns one of those promotions in Japan now, I believe. He owns it. Um, I can't remember which one, but I think he owns one of them. So, you know, Muta, you know, Muta was, you know. Yeah, the Muta was going hard for like about a good 50, about 40 years. Yeah, yeah, but he pretty much retired Jushin now. Thunder Liger of... just retired too. Who's that? Oh, Jushin Thunder Liger. Jushin yeah. Thunder, Thunder Liger. Yeah. At the beginning of the year, yeah. he got retired. Jushin would have to be like in his fifties now. Yeah, he was in his fifties. I want to know what he looked like. Because <laughs> like. he had on the costume <laughs> and stuff, so he still looked good. That's crazy. We still don't know what he looked like. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing about us Japanese boys They are I mean they are dedicated Shout out to our Asian That's brothers That's that K-Fade oh, They keep it K-Fade yeah. <laughs> yeah man They keep K-Fade you know I mean? even on the holidays B. They don't even get their ass <laughs> off for Christmas <laughs> They showing up on the holidays And they give it like, look, <laughs> look, 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 back in the day, man, that was like when we were here about, you know, because Japan wrestling was overseas. So, you know, in the 80s, that was like, it was a major, major, like they would have run the pay-per-view occasionally for the Japan. Like, so, and I mean, some, I mean, some of those matches in Japan, like with Flair and Terry Funk would go over there and wrestle. And we saw barbed wire matches. We saw the explosions and we were like, yo, son, like, yo, they really doing it over Yo, man. I mean, in terms of theatrics, the Japanese, man, they go all out. And that Korea was, I mean, yo, it's just, man. I mean, of course, going down to Mexico with those death matches down there, Mexico, I mean, the, the level of uh, commitment to the art of it, because it is an art form to deliver that type of uh, performance. I mean, and then you're seeing this stuff. I'm like, yo, these dudes are actually in a ring with barbed wire around it. I'm like, yo. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, that is when you crazy. first see it. And then you see Not these dudes get thrown into Yeah, it's like these dudes get thrown into it, and it's like these dudes are actually getting cut up by it. And it's like, you you like, I mean, um, for all the hardcore legends, man, you know, Terry Funk, you know, Dusty Rhodes, you know, of course, Ric Flair, you know, Sabu, Mick Foley. Sheik, Mick Foley, yeah, man, yo, Mick is like the goth, I mean, yo, I mean, you know, yeah, man, I mean, he was one of the dudes that really, like, brought it to the forefront in terms of it, 
uh, of really being like that. I look, I remember when Sabu he came to WCW. He got so crazy they kicked him. <laughs> That's the one. Man. Yeah, he was there for like three weeks. <laughs> yeah, my man was there for like three weeks, man. He's like, yeah, you gotta go. <laughs> But he came, he came. He came for that Nick Foley school of hardcore. It's like, yo, this dude. Like, they were like, yo, we weren't ready for this shit. <laughs> we thought we was. Like, we, we don't know. Won. But that's their fault. Though. They should have knew what they were signing up. Yeah, I ain't watching none of these matches. You just signed them. <laughs> this dude said, "Who is to just jump through tables just to do it?" I like yo. These dudes are next level insane. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man, but uh, yeah, those man, guys, but, man, I mean. But, yeah, man, yeah, but, but we got about all five more minutes to spare, man. I mean, it was a fun conversation. We chopped it up about the parallels between the hip-hop game and the rap bit. I mean, the wrestling business, man. Tell everybody where they can oh, find you. Oh, you took it back. You music. called it the wrestling business. You called it the wrestling business. Wrestling business. That's wrestling. <laughs> took it back. It sounded like Ted Turner. Yeah. The wrestling business. But yeah, as far as my, my, my social media, they all the same. It's rated R underscore, so that's R H E D R underscore on Instagram, Twitter. Um, it's um YouTube. You can just throw me in the search bar. You pop right up. My newest stuff, like a couple of the joints I did with wrestling bios, and my newest video, the Ray Ray video, that's up there too. And just, yeah, come and check me out, man. I got something, like I said, in the next couple of days, I'll be able to, i have something else to be sharing with y'all. But I just, like, I just got to keep a lid on it until it's time. Definitely, man. Look, once again, you know, man, we are so honored. We're so privileged to have you on. You're welcome back anytime, man. Thank you so much. You yeah, know, we got to get back on yeah. here and talk more. We got you know that game we played where we was comparing the wrestlers to the, the um the hip hop artists. You got to keep that going, man. Like you can see, yeah, you know, people man. listen. Maybe people listening, they can they can throw us some of their suggestions too. See, because it's probably some some obvious ones we ain't even think of. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, so we can get to the yeah. Wait till we get that uh, wrestling panel thing going. Go. I might I might have to get that organized soon. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Know, I, got, I, I need to see it yeah, on that. We got you. We got uh, Madison J. Madison J. He's a heavy into the rap wrestling thing as well. My man, on uh, Leron Pierce. Big shout out to him. Yo, 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 Madison J. From like down, like South Carolina, or something like that, right? North Carolina, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, Madison, no, yeah, um, yeah. I heard it before, man. <laughs> like, oh wow. Yeah, Madison's a good friend of ours. Oh, that's what's up. I remember hearing his music like when I was like when I first started and I was getting online. I'm like I was trying to look around to see if somebody else is doing something like that. Then I seen his. I'm like that's what's up, son. Yeah, yeah I'm checking you out. Yeah. WWE going to start cutting them checks, man. They got to bring y'all in for to do themes or something. Something, man. I'm trying to get up with Jim Justin, man. Like yeah. <laughs> get one of his beats. He the Dr. Dre of this though. You gotta you gotta break some doors down here. Word. Get Word. That's like the final bus. <laughs> man, look, I can see it now, man. Look, the mixtape, you know, unite, look, you know, uh, under, undisputed, you know, united, man. You know, you and Jim, you know, basically doing a whole joint together, man. It's like, yeah. You know, that's, the, that's the end game. Anytime somebody asks me what's the goal, that's the end game. Like, get something else, you man. Pre- showing my appreciation, letting them know, like, like, yo, listen, man, you a big part of this because watching wrestling, that's how you get introduced between that and MTV. That's how I got introduced to other genres of music. My mom wasn't playing no rock in my house and none of that, but I got the <laughs> head rock music listening to listening to these certain, certain things. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that's what that is. Country music, Jeff Jarrett theme, like all types of music that wrestling get to introduce you to. So I feel like, yeah, yeah I came from the Came from the God, man. So, got to show the show the proper sin, man. Definitely, definitely, Double man. J. Jim Johnston. Yes, definitely, sir, man. man. So, 
On that note, man, I'm about to sign up out of here. Yeah. Man, we had a great time chopping it up with you, man. We're going to definitely. Yo, thank you, man. I appreciate up, man. that, man. We're going to that thing. Oh, I appreciate that, y'all. We definitely got to let me back. And I'm going to do the same with y'all, with y'all content, man. Share it on my little platform, whatever I can, man. Just let me know whatever y'all need. For sure, man. Look, and ain't no count out, you know, because OTC always stay in the ring pinning the competition, man. <laughs> so we the, we the undisputed <laughs> world champions of this. I was fighting all the lanes in the submission, you know, figure four, Boston, for all those crabs out there, yo. Uh, on that note, man, once again, shout out to a, shout out to our guest Rated R, and we are out. We out. One. Peace.